I want to begin by asking how revolutionary we think these images are. This is some images of the 50th anniversary of revolution in 1967 and the 60th anniversary in 1977. If you compare the image on the left there and this image, I think we can see there are great similarities between them. In some senses, of course, these images are quintessentially revolutionary. Here we have the key uh, revolution anniversary of 1917. It's being celebrated with classic revolutionary iconography, Lenin and Marx, and mass processions to convey unanimous support for socialism of the kind we still see actually performed in uh, North Korea, for example, today. But the similarity across this decade and the regimented nature of these celebrations might give us pause. It might make us ask, is this Im imagery really revolutionary anymore? What happens to revolutionary imagery when it's repeated and rehearsed in this way? And the bigger question, how relevant was the memory of revolution and Bolshevism to the Soviet Union of the 60s and 70s? Western commentators, who often, of course, watch these celebrations to try and work out who was top dog in the Kremlin, um, had a pretty clear answer. People participated out of obligation, not enthusiasm, and the regime couldn't even imagine new ways to represent revolution, let alone realise it in real life. So I think these two images prompt us to wonder, was the Soviet Union after Stalin still a revolutionary state? Was it still on the way to communism or veering off course, ever more liable to be subjected to revolution in its own right? We know now, of course, how things turned out. But does 1991 really prove that the Soviet Union could not have survived in circumstances other than those created by the Gorbachev reforms? Rather than engaging in any kind of counterfactual history, today I want to show instead how Soviet, Soviet life after Stalin became, in some ways, and for some of the population, more livable. And this desire for a more normal, comfortable life was actually central to the regime's own reimagined pro uh, promise to the population. But in other ways, in making these promises, in keeping some of them and failing in others, the Soviet authorities themselves became more distant from leaping forward to communism. Ironically, it would then be Gorbachev's attempts to re-energize that revolutionary ideal which precipitated the regime's collapse. But one could argue that a slow-burning revolution, or at least a desire for change, bubbled under the surface of Soviet life for years or even decades before that. So let's go back in time and think about what sort of revolution did the Bolsheviks envisage and enact 50 and 60 years before these photos were taken? Well, the socialist revolution was supposed to be a total transformation of politics, economics, society and everyday life from day one, even if communism itself would take longer to arrive. Capitalism was to be replaced by the state ownership of the means of production, which was immediately realised in so-called war communism, though that was later reversed for a few years in the 20s with the um, so-called new economic policy, which reintroduced elements of the market. Industry was to take precedence over agriculture, though the latter was also supposed to be modernised and eventually collectivised in support of industrial growth. The proletariat would assume power, and we can see this, I think, quite well in uh, Sergei Eisenstein's um, famous film October, made for the 10th anniversary of the revolution, which depicts this as a kind of mass event, which arguably it was not. Um, and actually, Lenin himself admitted in writings before the revolution that initially the revolution would have to be channeled through what he called a vanguard of professional revolutionaries, most of them not proletarian, until the workers had become sufficiently numerous and conscious. But the revolution was wider, and it was more utopian than that. It also meant the breakthrough to what this poster calls a new way of everyday life, the total transformation of the population into new Soviet people. The Bolshevik state in its early years was arguably the most revolutionary state in the world, especially from the point of view of doing away with what this poster refers to as kitchen slavery. Radical reforms to legislation on abortion, marriage, divorce and gender equality all brought millions of women into the workplace and transformed family life beyond recognition, at least in the cities, where, although the village um, retained much of its traditional way of life. In the early years of Soviet power, members of the artistic avant-garde enthusiastically imagined new forms of architecture, clothing and communal living that would revolutionise the outer forms and the inner experience of life under Bolshevism. So let's then fast forward back to the 60s and 70s. What remains of these kind of revolutionary dreams? Well, the party still holds a monopoly of power. 
The commanding heights of the economy still lie in state hands and targets are set by the party on the five-year plan principle. The Soviet Union is full of factories and collective farms with no real unemployment. But, and this is the first big change, instead of proletarian hegemony, a vast middle class of skilled and white-collar workers has formed, largely because of mass access to higher education after the war. This is what the Soviet Union called the intelligentsia, although in the West we tend to use the word in a rather narrower, more elite sense. By the 60s, migration to the city is no longer a new phenomenon. By the start of the 60s, the majority of the Soviet Union's population is already based in urban centres. Instead of the early post-revolutionary experiments with communes, the typical, but though not universal, dwelling for a Soviet family is a private one-room apartment, often in new housing developments towards the then outskirts of cities. The family itself is no longer under siege as it used to be, though the demographics of Soviet society are still affected by the war. Men are in short supply and grandmothers take on much of the childcare. Women almost universally work, but also almost universally bear the double burden of childcare and housework, a far cry from the Bolshevik war on kitchen slavery. Walk inside that one room family apartment in this picture from a very popular Soviet film of the 70s, you might typically find shelves upon shelves of books, a TV, a fridge, you can just see one in the picture there, a wardrobe of Soviet and Eastern Bloc produced clothing. You might also find family and friends putting the world to right over tea or vodka around the kitchen table, listening to the radio, watching TV. Come back out of this apartment, you might pop to the shops to buy some groceries, though long queues mean that it's rarely a quick or predictable process. You might take the shiny new metro line from your, from your uh, district of the city to browse a department store in the city centre, attend a theatre or an opera performance. For some rather unusual families, there might be a car parked near the apartment. When they needed to leave the city, families might take that car, or more usually a suburban train, to their dacha out of town, another perk available to millions of Soviet citizens. Once or twice a year, they might holiday in a state-owned spa somewhere warm, but still inside Soviet borders like uh, Sochi or Crimea, usually after getting hold of a voucher from their place of work. Now, this post-Stalinist lifestyle that I've described was not universal by any means. Those who did not or could not move permanently out of the countryside, who could not acquire a hard-to-get residency permit for the big Soviet cities, or who were prevented by regulations from moving too far from the Gulag site where they had served a prison term, all these kinds of people found Soviet life extremely tough into the 60s and 70s. This was not quite a struggle for survival, but it offered little more than hard work, poor food, bleak housing, minimal leisure facilities, and consequently high levels of drinking and hooliganism. But the key point is that this good life here, um, this ideal embodiment, uh, became, the, became really the embodiment of the promises of socialism, if not, of course, of the very different ideal of communism. Now, consumption, if not consumerism, was celebrated. So too was a, a particularly Soviet version of family life, private life, and leisure time. And the Soviet everyman was just as likely to be a scientist, engineer, or academic as a worker or a peasant. So had the middle class taken over, was this the revolution betrayed? Trotsky famously attacked Stalinism as the thermidor of the Bolshevik revolution, a moment when the promises of 1917 were ripped up and discarded in favor of conservatism, bureaucracy, and ultimately totalitarianism. One wonders what Trotsky would have made of an apartment like this or of the city of Moscow 20 or 30 years after his death, a much more prosperous place than in 1917 or 37 even, but also a more relaxed, normal place. This was indeed a retreat from the demands and some of the utopian visions of Leninism and Stalinism, but it was not a move toward dictatorship. In fact, the post-Stalin leadership has often been seen as much more technocratic and bureaucratic. Although many changes that took place in Soviet life after Stalin were unwelcome to Khrushchev and Brezhnev and their successors, they were often rooted in the party's own reorientation of the Soviet project. And that reorientation was toward reward and towards voluntary and enthusiastic rather than coerced work and self-improvement. So how is this different, we might ask, from the Soviet Union under Stalin? After all, in 1934, Stalin had famously proclaimed that, quote, life had become better, more joyous, comrades. And the period of high Stalinism in the mid-30s 
was publicly celebrated with images of the good life, more plentiful cl food, clothing, even cars, champagne and caviar. The new supposed freedoms of the Stalin constitution were also celebrated, and Stalinist film musicals such as Volga Volga and Circus dominated the screens. But alongside this feel of jollity and relaxation, Stalinist propaganda also solemnly celebrated extraordinary physical challenges, such as the hewing of exceptional amounts of coal in a single shift by Alexei Stakhanov, who gave the movement for this kind of extraordinary work its name, Stakhanovism, um, or risky non-stop Arctic flights, such as those undertaken by the pilot Valery Chakalov in the late 1930s. It was these kind of exceptional heroes who stood the best chance of living the Soviet lifestyle. His Stakhanov pushing along his nice new car and wearing a nice suit. Um, but this was far from a universal lifestyle. In fact, it was accessible only to those very few whom the Stalinist state thought had most truly earned it. This can also be seen in the contrast between the relatively luxurious private apartments that were doled out to state apparatchiks and the miserable communal dwellings of the vast majority of the population in the 30s and 40s. This disparity became especially stark after the war and led the cultural historian Vera Dunham to describe this elite service and reward as the post-war big deal. And, and Stalin's painting, I think, captures that rather nicely. So this good life then was part of a social contract that reserved its benefits only for exceptional effort and loyalty in service of the state. The less spectacular feats achieved by ordinary workers were not rewarded in anything like the same way. Under Stalinism, the private apartment or car were impossible dreams for the vast majority. This was not just a matter of economic constraint. Uh, for most of the Stalin era, the state told its citizens and apparently truly believed that it was living in a state of emergency, surrounded by hostile powers and needing to shore up socialism in one country as quickly as possible. This was epitomized by the so-called Udarnik or shock work movement. This need for sacrifice uh, and exceptional progress made any real mass pursuit of personal comfort practically and morally impossible. This belief that the Soviet Union was existentially vulnerable was a major factor driving Stalin's great turn towards rapid uh, collectivization and industrialization and the five-year plans at the end of the 1920s. It was when these policies had apparently got through the worst of their initial crises, such as mass resistance to collectivization, that Stalin then proclaimed the joyousness of Soviet life. Perhaps he had realized that even uh, there should be at least some illusion of reward in state rhetoric alongside these motifs of mobilization and emergency of the first five-year plans. Despite this brief shift, though, between the revolution and World War II, personal comforts were always secondary to the world historical task of catching up with and overtaking Soviet rivals. The outbreak of war made this rhetoric more urgent, but also more real. Finally, this was a real visceral war for survival rather than an inflated ideological conflict. It's impossible, I think, to overstate the sacrifices and heroism of the Eastern Front, from the siege of Leningrad to the ferocious battles for every last building in Stalingrad. For all the horror, suffering and hardship of 1941 to 45, many soldiers, journalists, writers and ordinary people on the home front recalled feeling a deep sense of purpose and a genuine willingness to do whatever it took to protect the Soviet Union, or, as many conceived of it, to defend the Russian heartland. When Victory Day dawned on 9th of May 1945, it was reward enough, at least for a while. But the question of how these extraordinary wartime sacrifices would be recognised and recompensed quickly came to the fore. There was a widespread expectation uh, amongst the Soviet population that the somewhat expanded freedom of expression and religious belief that had been permitted during the war would be preserved, if not expanded. More generally, survivors of this conflict that had taken 27 million lives had pressing health and welfare needs, as well as a general sense of entitlement to reward. But the famous Soviet historian Sheila Fitzpatrick has argued that actually what she calls the return to normalcy took the best part of two decades. The post-Stalinist lifestyle that I described at the start of the lecture was not fully established until the 1960s. The war certainly allowed the Soviet state to shift its focus from self-defense to self-assertion in the post-war world order, but it set back this always very fragile vision of the good life domestically. This wasn't just post-war austerity of the kind that we see in many other cultures immediately after the end of war, but it was an inability to deliver even basic needs to the population. 
In the late 1940s, even communal apartments could not be guaranteed. Food supplies were catastrophic, especially in the famine year of 1946 to 47, and public health and sanitation were in a parlous state. Much of this, one might say, as unavoidable, given the huge damage the Soviet territory had suffered during the war. But what was more avoidable, certainly, was a new ideological campaign launched against, amidst this uh, economic crisis, the so-called Stanovshina, which was intended to replace the limited freedom of the war years with Stalinist dogmas in science, literature, and many other domains. Furthermore, in the years between the end of war, the war and the death of Stalin in 1953, the Gulag population swelled to an unprecedented two million prisoners, and waves of lethal terror targeted Jewish intellectuals and the Soviet medical profession, amongst many other victims. So this post-war re-Stalinization then seemed to take the Soviet Union in quite a different direction from post-war Europe and America. But the historian Donald Raleigh has argued that in some ways, what he calls Soviet baby boomers did eventually emerge, and actually became, in many ways, the defining image of post-Stalinist Soviet life. So how did this happen, and when did it happen? Certainly, there was only limited scope under late Stalinism for anything to change. But occasionally, policymakers started to try to point out problems even before Stalin died. There was some discussion just before Stalin died of the creative crisis in, in Soviet literature and film, for example. And there were some experiments with new uh, housing construction. But most parts of the Stalinist party state remained absolutely invulnerable to criticism because they'd become so tightly intertwined with Stalin himself. In this sense, then, the death of Stalin in March 1953 presented a real opportunity, but perhaps also a real danger. What did Soviet socialism look like without Stalin? Lavrenti Beria, the head of the NKVD, was the first to realise that Stalin's disappearance in and of itself did much to open up Soviet policy to rethinking. Although he was associated with the worst excesses of the Stalinist terror and gulag, or maybe because he had seen them up close, Beria knew that Soviet crime and punishment needed a thorough shake-up. Forced labour was no longer economically efficient, terror was destructive and divisive. Beria took the decision to amnesty several million criminal and then later political prisoners from the Gulag, and it was undoubtedly the earliest sign of the de-Stalinisation that lay ahead, though di direct attacks on Stalin would take a few more years. The amnesties radically downsized the Gulag, they didn't shut it down entirely. And it created a huge logistical challenge of what to do with these hundreds of thousands of people who needed jobs and homes, but usually could not return to the ones they'd had before their arrests. However, the most profound consequence of this change was the shift to the post-terror state. What the poet Anna Akhmatova, who was herself, her family uh, was very much uh, victimised by terror, she called it the vegetarian post-Stalin era. It was not at all that the Soviet state had uh, ceased to persecute its enemies or send them to the Gulag, but rather that arbitrary bloodletting campaigns had come to an end. Memoirs of the time evoke a sense of profound relief and relaxation to do with this shift away from mass terror. The realisation that the state would no longer use lethal punishment against its opponents, and perhaps also that its definition of its opponents had become a lot tighter, this had wide ramifications especially for the intelligentsia, for whom the consequences of speaking more freely now seemed less grave than ever before. In this way, the renunciation of Stalinist terror was crucial to starting what have often been called the cultural thaws of the 50s and the 60s. The unravelling of the Stalinist model of coercion began very quickly in other domains too, very quickly after Stalin's death. Georgi Malinkov and Vyacheslav Molotov vied for power in the early months and years after Stalin's death. But unlike Beria's focus on terror, they focused largely on the economy. In 1954 to 55, they and the Central Committee repeatedly talked about shifting away from the Stalinist focus on heavy industry and towards consumer goods production. Like the Gulag amnesties, these changes again had much broader and deeper ramifications because they signaled the beginning of a long and, as it turned out, irreversible shift from sacrifice to reward and from emergency to normality. By Western standards, of course, the Soviet economy remained unusually focused on heavy industry and agriculture, but there was a shift. Soviet citizens were now celebrated as consumers en masse. They were promised better food, nicer clothing and shoes, previously scarce goods such as fridges, televisions and cars started to become a more normal 
uh, an imminently attainable aspiration for the broad population. Moreover, this consumer lifestyle was not only going to compete with that of the US and Western Europe, it was going to beat them at their own game. And this was captured, I think, very well in the so-called kitchen debate between Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon at the American National Exhibition in Moscow in 1959. So here's Khrushchev um, berating Nixon. And what he's, one of the things that he says during this um, public debate is, quote, you think the Russian people will be dumbfounded to see these things. But the fact is that all newly built Russian houses have this equipment right now. In Russia, all you have to do to get a house is to be born in the Soviet Union. You're entitled to housing. In America, if you don't have a dollar, you have a right to choose between sleeping in a house or on the pavement. Yet you say, we are slaves to communism, end quote. So this exchange uh, captured how Cold War competition had moved into more intimate personal settings, but it still dealt in ideological and moral absolutes. Khrushchev was now promising the Soviet population just as nice a kitchen and apartment as in the American dream. But the distinctiveness of what he was promising lay in its universal reach, its transcendence of class divisions. Everyone in the Soviet Union could access this lifestyle and its guarantee would be underwritten by the state. Khrushchev's uh, bullish confidence in this uh, kitchen debate was partly a matter of character, but it also derived from the rapid progress of the mass housing drive of the 1950s and 60s, which he did see as truly revolutionary. To use the words of John Reed, he once observed, we shook the world with our massive programme to build housing for our people. In the 1950s and 60s, unprecedented numbers of Soviet families moved out of communal flats and into one-bedroom apartments. Here's a sort of mock-up of some of them. These apartments were hardly luxurious or spacious. In fact, these predominantly prefab constructions quickly became known in common parlance as Khrushchevi, which, which combined Khrushchev's name with the Russian word for slum or Trushoba. However, um, the contrast to the previous homes and to the state's previous disregard of housing was truly striking. Moving to this private apartment, however modest, demonstrated the difference between Stalinism and post-Stalinism. Happy housewarmings across the Soviet Union symbolised the start of a new era and a new Soviet lifestyle. Of course, this was still not universal. In 1965, for example, 55% of Russian Federation citizens lived in private apartments. In older cities, more than that tended to live in communal apartments, and in new settlements, this kind of housing was more of the norm. Like the post-Stalinist changes to terror and the shift to consumer goods, this drive to provide individual apartments had consequences far beyond this specific policy domain. The right to a personal apartment powerfully incarnated the state's recognition of good citizenship and state service. But, perhaps more crucially, it conferred the right to a private life, albeit, as we'll see, subject to rather strict conditions. So this move away from the gulag, the move into the private apartment, did more to de-Stalinize Soviet life than the direct attacks on Stalin that Khrushchev would orchestrate in the mid-50s and again in the early 60s. The Soviet system could not, in fact, afford to dwell on its traumatic past for long, and it did not want to. Confronting the full extent of Stalinist wrongdoing was impossible because it would have un undermined crucial parts of Soviet history that still underpinned the Soviet system. Each time that the terror and the gulag and even the dark sides of the war were allowed to be discussed, as in the secret speech of 1956, for example, the regime quickly clamped down on its own initiative within months. In fact, I think one could argue that Khrushchev initiated de-Stalinization, above all because he wanted to move forward to the communist future, unimpeded by the past. His endorsement of de-Stalinization peaked in the early 60s, and Perhaps the best example of that is his personal authorization of the publication of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag story, Ivan Denisovich. But at this time, so did his optimism about the future. In 1961, he orchestrated massive public discussion of terror and had Stalin's body secretly removed from the Red Square mausoleum. But that same year, he also spearheaded the new party program. The 1961 program's vision of Soviet life included a detailed moral code for the builders of communism, and it held sway for many years to come. It included such prescriptions as conscientious labour for the good of society, he who does not work shall not eat, high consciousness of public duty, intolerance towards the violation of public interests, collectivism and comradely mutual aid, one for all and all for one, honesty and truthfulness, moral purity, simplicity and modesty in social and personal life, 
and intolerance towards injustice, parasitism, dishonesty, careerism, and money grubbing. Now, the year before this programme had emerged, Khrushchev had already upped the utopian rhetoric of the kitchen debate with his claim that the Soviet Union would achieve communism by 1980. The space race of the period further stoked this mood of enthusiasm. The spectacular successes of Yuri Gagarin and Valentina Tereshkova demonstrated the superiority of Soviet science and thus of the system, but also, I think, in a, in a broader sense, captured the sense that revolutionary dreams were becoming reality in the Soviet 60s. This underlying, unremitting drive toward the communist future helps to explain the tensions embedded throughout post-Stalinist everyday life, which I'll return to shortly. And it also, I think, explains why those tensions and this basic orientation endured despite the very large differences in character between the post-Stalinist leaders. Khrushchev promised to leap forward to communism within two decades, whereas Brezhnev created the doctrine of so-called developed socialism to explain why communism had to be approached gradually and would therefore be deferred until further notice. Where the short Soviet 60s, so from roughly 1961 to 68, are often remembered as a time of optimism, captured I think here, the long Soviet 70s, from the reaction to the Prague Spring to the start of Gorbachev's reforms in the mid-80s, these have usually been described as a time of stagnation. But there were far more fundamental continuities between Khrushchev and Brezhnev's regimes than there were differences. None of the core post-Stalinist changes that I've described was reversed when Khrushchev was ousted from power in a bloodless coup in 1964, becoming the first Soviet leader to leave office alive. Terror did not resurface, the housing drive did not stop, and neither did the orientation toward consumer goods. Fundamentally, the Soviet system now rewarded its citizens for good behaviour, and imagined that reward in curiously similar, if morally superior, ways to its Western rivals. It also hoped, fervently, that its citizens would transform into good communists without coercion, albeit with considerable guidance from the state. What was offered to citizens in the Khrushchev and Brezhnev eras then was a distinctively socialist, still highly ideologised version of normality. Take life in the so-called private apartment. While the flat itself was not privately owned and could only be individualised to a limited degree. And in fact, the, um, the film still that I showed you earlier, the, the, sort of, um, the storyline of that film revolves around a man um, getting drunk, travelling uh, between Moscow and Leningrad, going into an apartment that looks identical to his own and not realising that it's not in fact his own because it looks so, so similar. Um, but of course, people did try and sort of make the apartments their own with a variety of creative homemaking practices. These apartments were built and designed in a functional way. They drew quite interestingly on Scandinavian design principles. They were not intended as a cosy uh, domestic retreat. And in fact, a lot of the furniture was sort of collapsible and there were sort of zoned areas to prevent people from getting too comfortable. And uh, propaganda of the time still mocked those who were, who were obsessed with domestic comforts and acquisition of material goods. Watching TV and listening to radio as well as reading dominated leisure time in this sort of apartment since TV and radio had been rolled out to most Soviet homes by the end of the first two decades after Stalin's death. However, of course, media production was state-controlled and censored. Anniversary celebrations of the kind I showed you at the beginning dominated schedules for weeks around the major dates and Soviet news was often stayed in the extreme. Although some innovations in Soviet TV proved enduringly popular, such as game shows and uh, strangely spy serials, there was one called 17 Moments of Spring, which was very popular. But the Soviet authorities, of course, could not entirely jam foreign broadcasts, and other socialist media provided some variety, even for those who didn't listen to Voice of America or the BBC. There was a reading revolution amongst this increasingly educated population, but all book production was subject to censorship, in line with the principles of socialist realism. Here again, though, the Soviet authorities could no longer stop the spread of unofficial literature or samizdat, though they did police it aggressively. Inhabitants of private apartments were also expected to participate in a variety of communal and public activities, not least the so-called subotnik, or weekend projects to beautify their neighbourhoods. Neighbourhoods also had their own comrades' courts, to which minor local offences were routinely devolved so that bad behaviour could be publicly exposed and shamed. There were hundreds of roving brigades which patrolled the street, meeting out punishment for immoral behaviour and, um, and Western dress, although these were more of a phenomenon of the Khrushchev era than later. More generally, while the Gulag was being downsized and political convictions becoming less common, 
although many hundreds, if not thousands of dissidents were still sent to the Gulag or otherwise punished, the state got tougher on petty misdemeanors. It broadened the category of hooliganism and increased penalties for it. Bad behavior such as drinking and brawling became a more urgent moral problem as Soviet society allegedly got so closer to communism. The same was true of the revived offense of parasitism. Essentially, this meant not engaging in productive labor as defined by the state, which was used to persecute disobedient members of the intelligentsia, including famously Josef Brodsky, the poet. What about the workplace? Well, here too, a distinctive moral code and complex system of reciprocity prevailed. The privileges that I mentioned earlier, such as dachas and spa holidays like this, were in the gift of the state. They depended on hard work, or at least the appearance of it, and good behaviour. The latter construed as not publicly questioning certain basic Soviet ideals and participating in public rituals such as the anniversary celebrations which were replicated in microcosm across all Soviet institutions. The party thoroughly uh, penetrated the Soviet workplace. People were not obliged to join, but membership carried considerable privileges. It carried powers to discipline colleagues and shape institutional policy, and it conferred preferential access to scarce consumer goods such as fridges, cars, luxurious foodstuffs, and even foreign fashion. Like all public workplaces, uh, public places, workplaces were also penetrated by the KGB, though to nothing like the same extent as the Stasi in East Germany. As for the post-war uh, boom in higher education, which I mentioned earlier, which helped to produce this vast middle class, here too restrictions applied. Students could not escape the obligation to take subjects such as dialectical materialism, and the, curricul the curriculum in general was subject to significant political interference. On graduation, many students had to accept state instructions on where they would work, sometimes being assigned to jobs at the other end of the Soviet Union, though there was scope to get round this with the right contacts. Most students would also be part of the Komsomol or Communist Youth League. And throughout the, the Khrushchev and Brezhnev eras, this Komsomol mobilised large brigades of youth to participate in ambitious, if ultimately failed, projects such as the cultivation of the virgin lands in the Khrushchev era and the construction of the Baikal Amur mainline or BAM in the 1970s. And you can see how, how, how little this propaganda differs from that of the early five-year plans. In this way, then, the Soviet authorities remained ideologically uncomfortable with the promises that they themselves had made after Stalin's death. They celebrated the pleasures of consumption, but feared a frenzy of consumerism. Private life was de facto granted to the majority, but that privacy was ideologically uncomfortable for the regime, who intruded upon it in many different ways. Even within the walls of the private apartment and certainly outside it, Soviet citizens faced a barrage of propaganda discourse and mobilizational rituals. The authorities lauded education and were proud of the rapidly growing intelligentsia, but they limited what they could listen to, read or watch. While granting citizens more relief and relaxation than ever before, the party also exhorted them to keep moving towards communism in their work and their personal lives too. Socialism was supposed to be lived in every moment, at every place. So were these tensions unworkable then, or could they be held in equilibrium, perhaps potentially forever? Well, to some observers of the Brezhnev era, the Soviet Union had not only stopped progressing towards communism, but it was actually descending into entropy. In 1970, the dissidents Roy Medvedev, Andrei Sakharov and Valentin Churchin circulated an open letter urging a political solution to economic stagnation. Over the past decade, they argued, menacing signs of breakdown and stagnation have begun to show themselves in the economy of our country. A great mass of data is available showing mistakes and intolerable procrastination about finding solutions. These problems demand the creative participation of millions of people on all levels of the economic system. However, we encounter obstacles on the road towards the free exchange of ideas and information. Truthful information about our shortcomings is hushed up on the grounds that it may be used by enemy propaganda. That same year, another dissident, Andrei Amalric, also unofficially circulated his analysis of whether the Soviet Union could sur survive until the symbolic date of 1984, in which he observed, quote, contemporary Soviet society can be compared with a triple-decker sandwich. The top layer is the ruling bureaucracy, the middle layer, the middle class, or the class of specialists, and the bottom layer, the workers, peasants, and so on. Whether Soviet society will manage to reorganize itself in a peaceful and painful, painless way and survive the forthcoming cataclysm with a minimum of casualties will depend on how rapidly the middle layer of the sandwich expands at the expense of the other two. 
So we can see that Amalric, the second um, of the two distant letters, conceived of this crisis as destructive and dangerous, whereas the other distant petition imagined more of a sort of decay and entropy. Unlike the collective petition's demands for glasnost, uh, Amalric suggested that the Soviet middle class might actually help the Soviet Union to keep on surviving. And in fact, it is true that many Soviet citizens, especially of the middle class, did not find Soviet life as intolerable or crisis-ridden as these dissidents did. Private life, however the state sought to limit it in theory, was a reality for the majority of the population. Kitchen table conversations and other forms of socialising provided retreat and relief from the heavily, ideolog heavy, sorry, heavily ideologised public sphere. The workplace was relatively free of the exhortations to record work productivity which had once characterised the Stalinist economy. However, it is true that late Soviet consumers found consumption increasingly irksome. As the Brezhnev era progressed, deficit, or deficits in desirable foodstuffs, homeware and fashion worsened, leading to lengthening queues and inordinate amounts of, of work and leisure time lost to standing in them. That's a cue for um, uh, shoes um, in the Brezhnev era. Part of the problem was that the centrally planned economy could not rationally respond to consumer demand by being flexible with its outputs or prices. Another was that overall productivity had started to decline in the early 60s and worsened over the next two decades. In 1983, a, a, a Siberian economist, Tatiana Zaslavska, presented a confidential paper on the state of the Soviet economy to her colleagues at a think tank in Novosibirsk. Leaked to the Western press soon after, the paper drew a stark picture of growth shrinking from around 7% in the mid-60s to just 2% in the early 1980s. Her conclusion was that the structure of the national economy long ago crossed the threshold of complexity when it was still possible to regulate it effectively from one single centre. However, it would take several more years before these radical suggestions would have any bearings on politics or economics at the centre. Meanwhile, most late Soviet citizens responded to this declining economic situation with less dr drastic and more pragmatic measures. They resorted instead to using the growing second economy to get hold of what they wanted. Observers at the time often noted just how important the black market was for the acquisition of most goods and how it gave rise, in turn, to a huge network of blat or informal contacts. One such observer of the Brezhnev era, the American economist James Miller, described all these practices as the little deal between the Brezhnev era regime and population. The deal went as follows. If you steered clear of dissidents or other serious misdemeanors, if you turned up to work, even if you didn't work too hard, then the authorities would turn a blind eye to informal practices such as purchasing goods on the side, known as nalieva, although these kinds of sort of um, businessmen of the black market um, were, were more harshly punished. This little deal embedded the Soviet population, except for the small, brave minority of dissidents, in a distinctively late socialist lifestyle, one which seemed to have no clear endpoint or looming crisis, despite its many failings. Indeed, a recent anthropological study of the last Soviet generation described it as believing that everything was forever until it was no more. The hollow rituals and cynicism of public life, the contrast to the greater authenticity of private life, and the failure of the official economy to deliver the regime's promises were all deep contradictions that Soviet citizens had to find ways to negotiate since they seemed set to last forever. However, when the Soviet Union did fall apart, the alienation from official ideology and its promises meant that the collapse almost immediately seemed inevitable to many people, even though they had not consciously seen it coming in most cases. So finally, how did the Soviet Union move from the timelessness of developed socialism to the hectic events of the late 80s and early 90s? The historian Stephen Hansen divided the post-Stalin period into two different approaches to time. Both Khrushchev and Gorbachev, he argued, took a revolutionary or charismatic approach to urging on the leap forward to communism, while Brezhnev took a more rational or realistic approach to when, or perhaps if, this would ever happen. Indeed, at the start of his tenure as Soviet leader, Gorbachev famously contrasted the dynamism of his proposed reforms to the stagnation of the Brezhnev era, when there seemed to have been a retreat from the goal of communism altogether. Gorbachev was from a very different generation and educational background to Brezhnev, and he sought to shake up what he called the gerontocracy that had presided over this stagnation. Gorbachev had been exposed to Western ideas, 
as had his close advisors, such as Alexander Yakovlev and others who had spent much of late socialism in liberal think tanks in the Soviet Union or abroad. According to his biographer, Archie Brown, Gorbachev would eventually adopt social democratic ideas of a Scandinavian type, moving away from anything recognisably socialist. But what Gorbachev intended to do, at least initially, was to import new ideas. It was not to import new ideas into the Soviet system, but to reinvigorate its original beliefs. He wanted to reinvest it with the ideological fervour that had been lost in the Brezhnev era and finally deliver on the hopes of 1917. In 1985 then, soon after his rather startling victory in the Central Committee contest to replace um, the recently deceased Chernyanka, Gorbachev announced the intertwined policies of Perestroika, Glasnost and Uskarienia, meaning respectively restructuring, openness and speeding up of the economy. What underlay all these policies was the desire to increase productivity and re-energise Soviet life, to better exploit the creative resources within the Soviet Union, as this poster described Perestroika. Glasnost would be enacted with the aim of exposing problems that were hampering growth and this progress towards communism. It was constructive and intended, as we can see here, to be strengthening. Like Khrushchev, Gorbachev also had ambitious plans that extended into morality, perhaps best captured in his disastrous anti-alcohol drive. Soviet life would undergo thorough purification, he hoped, and out of it the ideal of communism would finally be realised. In fact, what happened was more or less the opposite. Soviet life was hugely energised, especially in the media, which underwent a real boom of reader and viewer interest as Glasnost probed ever deeper into Soviet history, while also raising previously taboo subjects such as sex, prostitution and drug use. While cathartic, this was hardly the kind of purification that was intended, though uh, Gorbachev did do a fair amount to encourage it, at least for a while, especially after the lethal secrecy surrounding the Chernobyl disaster and then at the 1987 Party Congress, where he urged writers and filmmakers to finish off the de-Stalinisation of the Khrushchev years. By the end of the 1980s, though, this obsessive exposure had extended as far as Lenin and Leninism, contradicting Gorbachev's re-Leninisation intentions. Meanwhile, the expose of the seamier sides of Soviet life had become so widespread that they were categorised as a whole movement in art and journalism called Chernuka, or dark art. More broadly, Glasnost would eventually expose the true extent of perestroika required, not tinkering with the system, but revolutionising it. The dissidents of the early 70s had been right. The Communist Party monopoly was lifted in 1990, um, after several years of moving towards more democratic political bodies, such as the Congress of People's Deputies. Meanwhile, the cautious moves towards cooperatives and other incentivised forms of production in early perestroika were overtaken by rapid marketization and then the crash privatisation of the early 90s. The historian Stephen Kotkin argued that the Soviet system's collapse was Armageddon averted. There was no revolution, no major violence or wars over territory or assets. The system collapsed through a brief and abortive coup, followed by the signing of a series of formal agreements that dissolved the Communist Party and the Soviet Union itself in late 91. Many of the former Soviet republics, such as the Baltics, reacted to these events as the end of colonial oppression. But Russia, and arguably Ukraine too, were left with a more profound, chronic crisis of identity. With the benefit of more hindsight, we might argue, as the Guardian Moscow correspondent Sean Walker does in his recent book, that the collapse of the Soviet Union left a long hangover, which is now climaxing in the memory wars in Ukraine. However, the question of the Soviet legacy or legacies will be dealt with much more fully in the next lecture of this series by Bridget Kendall, and so I will end here. Thank you very much.